Today for our Unplugged Talk today, we're going to talk about baptizias. Now, uh, does everybody know what baptizias are or a lot of people new to them? Okay, we've got some that do and some that don't, all right? Uh, baptizias are one of our great Southeast natives, well not just Southeast, East Coast uh, natives, that are in the pea family. So many of the things we grow are in the pea family, not a lot of uh, ornamentals. Uh, the great thing about baptizias is the conditions which they tolerate. In the wild, they grow in incredibly dry soils, but you will also find them in the wild growing in ditches filled with water. So they have an incredible tolerance for moisture one way or the other. First year I went out in the field looking at baptizias, we were an hour north of Dallas in a little town called McKinney. And the baptizias there, they had been over 100 for 40 straight days. They had had no rain for two months. The baptizias in the wild look great. Any plant that looks that good, that is a tough plant. Baptizias come in a range of colors, generally white, blue, and yellow are the three colors that exist. Now, as breeders, we try to make something a little different combining those colors. So there's two blue species, uh, Australis and Minor. There's several yellow species, and there's three white ones and a couple of ivory ones. So we're gonna walk around today and look at some of those and look at what happens when we began mixing the genes up. So we'll start right behind us with the bright yellow. Okay, these are Baptisia sphericarpa. That's one of the yellow species. Sphericarpa, sphere means sphere, means round. Carpa means seed pod. So it means has round seed pods. It's the only one that has round seed pods. The one on the right is the Arkansas form of Baptisia sphericarpa. The plant on the left is a Texas form. So the exact same plant, which is why when we go out looking, we don't just look for the plant, we look for all the different genetics. So even though that is absolutely identical, depending on where it's from, it behaves very differently in the garden. The next one we're running into, is one of the blue species. <coughs> now, as I mentioned, there are two, Baptizia australis and minor. Australis is big. Australis is like five feet across and about four feet tall. Minor is basically, minor means dwarf. It's a dwarf form of Australis. And this is native from Nebraska all the way to Durham, North Carolina. So this is one of the few that's actually native right here in our own backyard. Uh, really amazing plant. Generally does not have a lot of flower spikes, but what we do is when we go out, we'll collect seed. And uh, we collected some seed, uh, again, north of Dallas, that uh, one of the seedlings had 57 flower spikes on a plant. So those are the ones that get named, and then we propagate those by cuttings. One of the most unusual, if you look straight over there, you'll see one with gray leaves. This plant right here is a baptisia. Doesn't look anything like it. This is known as the spiderweb baptisia, baptisia arachnifera, native to only two counties on coastal Georgia. Now it is a summer flowering species. So all the baptisia flower now, except for two. And they flower in the summertime. That one we grow for the foliage. It has yellow flowers, but the spikes are pretty short. Now, one of the most interesting baptisias it's right here. I'm standing on it. This is Baptisia simplicifolia. It means it has a simple leaf. It is from the panhandle of Florida, and it does not emerge out of the ground until July. Oh, cool. Which is crazy. It flowers in September. Now, why plant in Florida? Generally, plants in Florida come up really early. So this plant is totally, it's got something messed up. <laughs> And even though it's native to the Panhandle of Florida, it's hardy outside in Zone 5, which would be Chicago. It's really weird. It's one of those things that through the years, climate change has moved plants all around. This one got left out in Florida. But if you come back in July, there's a huge plant right there in that big open space. Baptisia simplicifolia, the simple leaf baptisia. Okay, now this is another Baptisia minor. We looked at earlier. This is the earliest one to bloom for us. This one bloomed back in March. And this one does have about uh, 50 flowers on it. It's really quite extraordinary, but this time of year you don't notice it. So that's what we're looking for is early, mid, and late. Now there are a group of Baptisias right here that all the spikes are horizontal. 
This is Baptisia leucophaea. This is common all up and down the Midwest and all the way down into Florida. This is also very early. So this one is in bloom in March before anything else. It's fascinating, but it does never has flowers that stand up. Always go sideways. Now, just that one, Tony, does that one take part shade? Uh, it's an interesting question. Shade? Okay, the question was, do baptisias take shade? In the wild, you will actually find them in some light shade occasionally. They never look as good. They never flower as heavy. But in terms of growing, yes, they will grow there. Just not thrilled about being there. Okay, this is one of the white species. This is baptisia alba. And Alba has a big range, and they divide it based on where it grows, but it grows from northern Minnesota all the way down to College Station, Texas. It has an incredibly wide range. Uh, this particular one is native uh, here in North Carolina to Wayne County. But really, I, I just think it's a very elegant species. And so anything to get color uh, ranges, color changes in the other colors, we blend it with this. Now, one of the most interesting is this Baptisia. This is Baptisia tinctora. This has the smallest leaves of any Baptisia. And this is native all over North Carolina. If you actually drive to the end of our road in three miles, you will find this growing wild. Now, it doesn't have much of a spike. It more has axillary flowers, teeny tiny. But when we want to breed and get more of a fine texture in, this is the plant we use. You'll see it all the way down to the coast. And this one in the wild grows pretty much always in light shade, in sort of open forest. Ah, good question. Uh, the question was about, do you need to deadhead baptisias? The, the question would then be, how many do you want? Because when the flowers finish, you get seed. And if you don't get the seed, they will come up all over. Now, if you get it, if you have more than one, they will not come true. Baptisias are very promiscuous. They are everywhere. So if you have a blue one and you want a blue one, you probably should not let it seed because you might have yellows and greens and pinks and all kinds of colors. But in terms of the health of the plant, it makes no, no matter. It's just how many seedlings do you want? So then at the end of bloom time, would you just sear it down like you would a grass? No, I just cut the top of the flower spikes off. We want to leave the rest of the plant because that gives energy to the roots. Right. So just, just sort of tip it on, on the tip. Now here's a very interesting Baptisia. This is another one native to Georgia and Florida only. This is Baptisia lanceolata. And it never has any spikes. All it has is what we call axillary, axillary flowers. So ornamentally, some people don't like it. I think it's actually quite cute. And if you'd have been here a week ago, it was it was you know, as showy as this species ever gets. It never gives you the wow moment, but really an interesting little plant. Actually, there's a lanceolata in uh, more full flower, so that's what that one looks like. It's, it's, uh, it's very quaint. Now, what we wanted to show here is what I talked about earlier, that the baptisias are very tolerant of moisture, even though they grow in very dry. So we planted one right here so that its feet are always in the water. This never dries out, and look how beautiful it looks. So the tolerance of moisture in these plants is just, there's almost nothing else that can grow in those two extremes. So what happened a few years ago, back in really 1998, we discovered what's called a monograph. Does everybody know what a monograph is? Okay, a monograph is a plant person who wants to write about a plant and has absolutely no social life whatsoever. <laughs> and they write about one particular genus. And so the monograph of Baptizia was written in 1939 by a, actually a female botanist, which in 1939, she obviously never had a date, Mary Maxine Laracy. And so we got her paper, and this is like a hundred and some pages, all about Baptizias. And she told where every single specimen that ever been documented in 1939 grew. So we headed out to all the sites. The beauty is that baptisias are not eaten by cows. And so we would go out in the middle of farm fields. Here's like a thousand acre farm. And everything is mowed to, the, to this tall except the baptisias. So we were able to bring back all these interesting genetics, and we shared those with, there's actually two other Baptisia breeders other than us, one in Michigan and one in Chicago. And they each have come up with their own plants. This is one from the Chicago program, Lavender Rose. 
the difference for us, and it was very interesting because we started off with similar genetics, but we all created different things. The Chicago plants, while nice, tend to have foliage that grows up into the flowers. So the flowers are not always as, as showy as we would like. Uh, this is more what you would find out of the Michigan program. They went more for colors. This is grape taffy, which is, a, again, a very nice plant. This also, I mean, they're all great. There's not a bad one. We tended to go more towards spike size because we used a, a plant we found in Georgia called Baptizia albescens. It's another white one, but it has really tall spikes. And we were able to create things like this you see over here. The purple one? Uh-huh. This is our first introduction. This is uh, uh, Blue Towers. But you see, we're more interested in <coughs> the spike size. And where the first two, if you notice, actually have foliage that goes right to the ground. We like Baptizias that have what we call neck and ankles because then you can plant stuff all around the base of them. So it's simply a matter of what each breeder was looking for. So you'll see all through here, like when you have something like this that's light yellow and white, that was a combination of the yellow genes with the white genes. The same for the very tall one over here, that was purple genes with white. And then as we get into these colors like we were seeing up here, there's, you get into browns, you get into purples, that's where you have the blues, the whites, and the yellows, and then been, go back and recross them, just sort of like you would find in your primary color chart to create colors that never existed in the genus. This is one called blue candelabra, and you see how thin that is with very tall spikes. So there's a lot of things you can do. There's another of the Michigan ones behind you, which is just absolutely gorgeous. Baptisias were the first plant to ever receive a federal crop subsidy in the U.S. Now, not many people realize that. And that actually happened on a significant piece of property. It happened on what is now the Masters Golf Course. That originally was a nursery, and before that, it was a farm growing Baptisia, which is called false indigo, because we could not grow real indigo here. So for false indigo, the U.S. government gave them a crop subsidy to produce false indigo, and that was Baptisia. So a little bit of trivia there about this wonderful native plant. So we were growing it in order for the ink? Yep, false? yep. And it inks and dyes. Yeah. And and we couldn't grow indigo here because of the climate too or because climate. of the climate. Yep, too cold. There's a lot of Baptisias to see around here. You just walk around. If you got any questions, I'm glad to uh, entertain those. I hope you'll give these a try. Yes. I forgot what you said. I didn't quite hear what you said about okay. the blue. Like you said, um, uh -huh. the, the blue color to not let them seed. Okay, any Baptisia that you allow to seed, if it's a species, if it's an original species, and you have no other Baptisias, it will come true from seed. If you have a hybrid, like any of these we've looked at here, your colors will be basically of all the generations that went into it. They'll be all over the place. Majority of them will look pretty ugly, honestly. So, so we would come in after it flowers, and we would snip the old stalks to keep it from seeding. Okay. But some people like it seeding. That's just strictly a personal preference. But just don't expect the colors to be the same. What do they do to transplant, move, separate the plants and move somewhere else? Great question. That depends on if you read books or not. If you read books, they're absolutely impossible to transplant, which is why we never let our plants read books, because they're actually very easy to transplant. <laughs> uh, I'd recommend doing it uh, middle of summer, late summer. There's absolutely no problem. They do have very thick roots and a very thick root system, but they transplant fine as long as you water them. Now, you can't dig a Baptisia up and not water it, but when you dig it up, water it really well, move it, water it well, keep it water till you're reestablished. We've had clumps we moved uh, last summer, last fall, that look as good as the ones that weren't moved. So it's, you know, every myth has some basis in reality. Somebody moved it one time and didn't water it and it died. And then they happen to write that Baptisias don't move well, but not true. How far out do you take the plant as far as the root length goes? Great question. Uh, as much as you can afford to pick up. The more, the better, because they do have very fleshy roots and very extensive. If I was doing it, I'd probably go out a foot around it and try to get that. But we've, I've dug them bare roots. They're fine. Uh, commercially, 
They dig them bare root in the fields. They dig them bare root in the fall. And I mean, there's nothing on them. So yeah. it's just, the key is just your aftercare. Are you gonna keep those roots from drying out? And are you gonna keep it from drying out once you plant it? But again, just don't read books. They really do mess you up with all kinds of things. Do the pods look like Question. peas or not? They do, yeah, they look very pea-like. And the, the, uh, the pods will be about, <laughs> Uh, generally about this size. Some are smaller, some are elongated like your finger. And once they turn brown, you can just pop them and the little seed in there are just like miniature butter beans. Oh, cool. They're really, really tiny. And when you're botanizing, you learn how to shell them with one hand and drive with the other hand. Just, uh, eat them. <laughs> uh, I can't say I've ever tried. I, I, you would have to be on a serious diet to want to eat. <laughs> I mean, they are really, the seed are like, when I say miniature butter beans, I mean the size of a pencil lead. They are really tiny, but, but they're fun to grow. They're really easy to, to germinate. And uh, Now, from cuttings, that's the other thing. Baptisias are <sighs> difficult from cuttings. So if you, if you want to take cuttings, you would take something like this and stick it, and it'll root easy. The key is getting it to overwinter, because what happens, it'll grow up, it'll do really well, and then when it goes dormant, if you don't have a leaf axle below ground, next year you have a thing of roots and no top. So when you plant it, once you root it, you have to, it needs to be longer than that. You have to get that leaf bud below ground or you will have nothing to come back next year. Yeah, it's one of the very few plants. And that's why commercially, it's very hard to find name varieties of Baptisius because the death rate is so high. If you get somebody that pots them wrong, you got 100% deaths. Other questions? anybody working on um, bloom, length of bloom time? Yes, uh, yeah, th that has not proven fruitful yet. It's uh, where our idea was to cross the uh, summer ones with the spring ones and see if we could get some repeat bloom and it just success has been very limited. It would be lovely. The, the key to use it, I think, is the genes off that real small leaf one I showed you called Tinctora because it has axillary side shoots. And that's what we're looking for is not just this, but then to come back with, with other plants on the side. So everything we have is rudimentary, but we are trying to head in that direction. So what is, that would be wonderful. What is the bloom time on most of that piece? Uh, again, the, the early ones we looked at start in March. Uh, we have others that start in May to early June. Duration. How long does it be? Uh, it, it all depends on the weather. I mean, if we have weather like we've had, uh, you know, before this hot spell, they'll last weeks. I mean, they're just really, some of the ones we have blooming now have been in bloom for three or four weeks. But if you get all 90 degree days for a week, they're going to be gone in a week. So it, it's 100% weather dependent. Now, it, to, to, to sequence the bloom, we go to different areas. We go to southern areas, we go to northern areas. We have, we started using a, a white form, was collected in Leroy, Minnesota. It does not emerge out of the ground till June. So we're able to that way extend the season. So I think the way we're gonna extend it is simply by having different cultivars that bloom over a longer period. One will bloom, go out, and then another one will come in. Other questions? All right, thank you very much. Please walk around, enjoy the baptisias.